Hello there my RPG lovers and welcome to another video. Cyanet Studio is a small video game developer from France, founded 23 years ago. I'm pretty sure that name doesn't ring a bell for you, because it's not a famous developer by any means. But what if I tell you that Cyanet developed more than 70 games over the past two decades? Granted, the majority of those games are sports simulations or cycling manager games to be more precise, but they also dabbled in other genres a little bit, like RPGs and action adventures. To be skilled or not be skilled, that is the question, and f you is the answer. Now here's the thing, we have 8 different games on this list in total. However, I already covered some of these games in my Hidden Gems or Trash videos, which is a running series on the channel. 3 out of 9 games to be more specific, so if you watch those videos, you'll know what I'm going to say about those specific games. Listen, if Silent Studio can make the same game with the same yellow bicycle character on the cover over and over again, I can repeat some things I said about their games in the past, okay? Speaking of characters, Raid Shadow Legends has a bunch of cool champions you can collect and build your party with. How about a very cool Lizardman with some great support spells to keep your party alive? But that wouldn't matter a lot if you don't have champions like Zavia the Dark Elf or Cecia Flame Tank to deal some brutal damage to your enemies. There are a bunch of heroes you'll be able to get and form a unique party. Raid Shadow Legends has several different gameplay modes. Campaign, Dungeons, Faction Wars, Arena and Doom Tower will put your epic party of heroes to the test. The first episode of Raid Shadow Legends series was recently released It gained 3 million views in 10 days. This game is available for free on pretty much all gaming platforms and it also runs smoothly on any hardware. Raid has great reviews on the App Store and Google Play, but for the ultimate experience, I recommend you play it on PC. This is your perfect opportunity to check out why millions of people are playing and talking about Raid. Download the game right now and use my promo code CLICK FOR GAMEPLAY to gain some cool rewards. You'll get 200k silver, 10 XP boosts for the epic hero Mordecai and other bonuses. And after 7 days of playing Raid, you will get the legendary champion Artak for free. Don't miss out on these rewards, so use my link in the description to download Raid for free. Number 8. Loki. Loki is a Diablo-like action RPG that came out in 2007 for Microsoft Windows. Around the same time period I was playing Titan Quest a lot, another Diablo-like action RPG that came out in 2006. When I got bored of Titan Quest after god knows how many hours, I eventually started looking for a new, similar game. I can't exactly remember how I discovered Loki and I don't know a single person on earth who heard about this game before. As the majority of games on this list, the reception for Loki was really average. It managed to score 61 from critics and 5.7 from users on Metacritic, and it has mixed reviews on Steam. Anyway, Loki allows you to choose between 4 unique characters. All of the playable characters are from different mythologies, and they start the game in different locations, with different quests to solve. It's a really interesting premise for the story, especially for a Diablo-like RPG. But the story itself is your typical mythology stuff. We carried off the wolf and raised him ourselves, so as to keep an eye on him since it was foretold that he would devour Odin at Ragnarok. When I started playing the game again, I went with the Norse hero, but I also played a little bit with other heroes, just for comparison's sake. Loki has some specific technical issues, which can be very annoying. I played the game on 4K with very decent frame rates. Although you're going to experience a lot of frame drops, and even when your FPS is very high, the game seems like it's dropping or skipping frames, which makes the gameplay feel really choppy. As for the gameplay itself, I always have the same criteria when it comes to Diablo-like games. The most basic thing you need to get right is to make the player feel good when you click on the enemy in order to kill them. Unfortunately, there are a couple of major reasons why Loki does a poor job with this. First of all, the controls feel sluggish and very unresponsive, especially if you compare the game to modern action RPGs. But even if you compare it to Titan Quest, the game that came out before Loki, or even the original Diablo 2, it feels way worse. There is a noticeable delay or input lag for every action you do, and even moving around doesn't feel smooth, which is a huge problem. As for the gameplay elements, Loki has a pretty standard Diablo-like formula. Loki fails to distinguish itself from other Diablo-like games, because it doesn't offer anything unique. But that wouldn't be a problem if the gameplay was a bit better. 
Loki has three difficulty levels that you can only unlock after you complete the previous difficulty, each hero has three different skill trees and casting spells is pretty much identical to Diablo 2. You have to select the ability from the action bar and then use the right mouse button to cast it. This worked fine when Diablo 2 came out. But similar games that came out only a couple of years after Diablo 2 started using a much better system for casting spells. You just press the corresponding button to instantly cast a different spell, it's much more convenient. But Loki decided to use an outdated system for some reason. Putting that aside, the spells that your character can use are pretty standard stuff. The weapon types deserve the most praise when it comes to the gameplay. You have a lot of different weapons that you can use if you have the level for it and appropriate stats. I was surprised to learn how some of the stats, like the range on the weapon, actually have a major impact in the combat. You can find very shiny looking weapons and armor for the current hero you're playing or even for other characters. I think that feature is always fun in these types of games because it can incentivize you to play the game with other characters and use the items you found. There is a way to upgrade and customize your weapons and that's pretty much it. Some of the enemy types in this game look very unique. I'm pretty sure that was everything positive I have to say about Loki. But yeah man, I was really disappointed with how the melee combat feels and I played way too long with the Norse hero before I switched to a range class. The Egyptian sorcerer and Aztec shaman control a bit better because the range combat is slightly more responsive. So if you're crazy enough to get this game, I highly recommend playing as a range character. The last thing I want to mention is the UI and not for a good reason. It's really bad. It's hard to compare stats on weapons and armor and this game doesn't have a character spreadsheet like most Diablo-like RPGs. The UI looks like it's in alpha version, it's very unfinished. Loki had the potential to be a solid Diablo-like RPG, but unfortunately it had many issues. Nowadays you can only get it on Steam and I wouldn't recommend buying it, mainly because of the poor performance. Number 7 Confrontation. After an isometric Diablo-like action RPG, Sinai Studio tried to develop a more tactical RPG called Confrontation. And tried is the key word here. Confrontation is the most poorly rated game on this list by far. It has 50 on Metascore and mostly negative reviews on Steam. I personally don't care that much about numeric ratings, but they can give you a general idea what to expect from a game. And people who watch my videos care about this stuff, so that's why I always include them. Anyway, after playing this game for a while, I actually don't think it's that bad. It's a very simple tactical RPG with real-time combat. Although saying that it's tactical is a bit generous, especially if you try to compare it to similar RPGs with tactical combat. I tried to play this game in a very mindless way, but that's because I wanted to test out the game design philosophy. It's been a while since I played a tactical RPG, but when I do, I always have the same approach. Select my whole party and just let them fight all enemies without using any abilities. That obviously won't work in a proper tactical RPG, and to my surprise it didn't work in this game either. Which by default means that I played a lot worse tactical RPGs in the past, so Confrontation is not the worst game out there. Yeah, I bet you can't wait to play this game now, right? That being said, you don't really have to use complex strategy to beat enemies in this game. In fact, it can be very counterproductive to try and use various spells that characters in your party gradually unlock. Not because those spells are bad by default, but because Confrontation has a lot of issues with control inputs and AI. More than often, you have to press the command way too many times for the character to react, which makes the gameplay very sluggish. Nothing in this game happens instantly after you press the button. It feels extremely unpolished in general, which can be very frustrating when the fights get harder. So my issue with the gameplay is on the fundamental level, and if the game was a bit more polished, I would probably be more motivated to finish it. Another pretty big issue I had with the game is the visual clarity, or the lack of it. It's very hard to see what the hell is going on on the screen when you get in fights with multiple enemies, which only happens like all the time. The health bars on your characters and enemies look the same and they don't blend well at all. But even the character models collide in a very awkward way and again, this circles back to that lack of polish discussion. Confrontation has RPG elements like leveling up, increasing your stats and some light itemization. The spells your characters get are automatic, but you can play around a bit with the progression system. 
it's not terrible, but it's not that good either, although the itemization is weak and kinda awkward. The story is exclusively presented through narrative segments before the map opens up, and I didn't have a clue what's going on, to be honest. Tactical RPGs usually have some interesting and memorable characters, but that's not the case with this game. You get the most generic party of characters with zero personalities. It's very generic and forgettable. That would be everything I have to say about this game, I guess. It's not the worst thing ever, and I would only recommend trying it out if you're a die-hard tactical RPG fan, but even in that case, you might want to think twice how you spend your free time. There are far better tactical RPGs out there, even on this list. Number 6. Game of Thrones I'm leaving for King's Landing in order to request an audience with the Queen. The first thing that comes to your mind when you hear the name Game of Thrones, well, that could be a lot of things, but I'm pretty sure words like forgotten or obscured is the last thing you would think of. However, this game had a very quiet release back in 2012. Maybe it's because the game was developed by a not so well known studio with almost no marketing budget. Even so, I think there should be a lot more interest for a Game of Thrones RPG. Although I need to remind you that this was in early 2012, so Game of Thrones was not exactly at its peak, but still, it was pretty popular even back then. Whatever the case might be for the underwhelming interest in this game, Cyanide Studio released a Game of Thrones RPG that nobody played. A one-on-one -on -one will be enough to satisfy me. I remember the first time I heard about this game from a gaming magazine I used to read back in the day. It was kind of fun collecting these things, and yeah, I'm a boomer, shut the hell up. Anyway, Sinai Studios got the rights for this IP, and they actually got George R. R. Martin himself to be a consultant on the game script. So I guess it's not a coincidence that the only redeeming factor of this game is the story itself. What can I do for you, handsome? Unfortunately, even the story itself won't give you a lot of reasons to consider playing this game, unless you're a huge fan of Game of Thrones IP. The lack of budget was very obvious, which heavily affected the quality of the presentation. The underwhelming presentation makes the story a lot worse than it should be. My lot kept out of it from the start. I don't give a damn. You've been a pain in our asses for far too long. Speaking about the story, you get to play as two different characters, Morse Westford and Alistair Sarwick. This game is divided by chapters, and at first you get to switch between these characters whenever the chapter is done. But as the story progresses, you get to control both of them at the same time, they're actually close friends. The story starts with Morse, chasing down a deserter from the Night's Watch. After this cutscene, the game allows you to control Morse in a couple of different ways. Game of Thrones doesn't have a character customization, because you get to play with these two well-established characters. However, you can choose different playstyles, improve their skills and stats, and acquire new gear. But the gameplay leaves a lot to be desired, to say the least. Game of Thrones plays like a CRPG with real-time pause from the third-person perspective. What has to be my biggest gripe with the gameplay is the party members, or the lack of them. A lot of chapters only allow you to control Morse or Alistair, which makes the combat encounters extremely boring. It feels like a streamlined CRPG with very slow-paced combat. Maybe it looks similar to games such as Baldur's Gate, Neverwinter Nights or Pillars of Eternity, but it's far from that, trust me. Don't let this game fool you, this is not exactly a party-based CRPG. Well, not in a traditional way at least, you only get to control two characters at once, and even that only happens in certain chapters. There are a lot of chapters in the game where you only get to control one of these characters, which makes the combat even worse. CRPGs with real-time combat and tactical pause should strive to be just that, tactical. If you ask me, the whole appeal to that combat system is how you choose to approach different combat situations, and how you build your characters in the party. They usually allow you to micromanage every move your character takes, if you desire, with an insane amount of customization for each character. Game of Thrones has some of that, but it feels very clumsy and not fun at all. Even the weapon hits feels like they lag for some reason. Some abilities can be fun to use, and you have to learn the simple rules of this combat system if you don't want to die. You have to use an appropriate weapon against different armor types, otherwise you'll deal miserable damage, even on normal difficulty. Fundamentally, this is a nice little feature that could have been way more interesting if the combat itself was any better. 
Come to think of it, this game kinda reminds me of Witcher 1, in a way. It has a really good story, with pretty bad gameplay and mediocre presentation at best. Although Witcher 1 managed to create an amazing atmosphere, and I can't say the same about this game. Blackbeard, that's Alistair Sarwick, one of Chataya's old lovers. Oh, intriguing. Do you think we can... Of course, if he wants it, but someone has to do it with him. Actually, I take that back. This game looked very outdated, even when it came out in 2012, let alone today, and the environments you're going to explore look extremely generic. Not to mention the horrible character models and low resolution textures. Even on 4K resolution the game looks pretty bad, and I couldn't get steady 60fps. If you can get past those issues, you could enjoy the story for what it is, but I would only recommend this game to big Game of Thrones fans. You'll get to meet a couple of well-known faces from the TV show, by the way. If you don't care for that, avoid this game like a plague. River Spring will soon be mine, and no one will stop me. Number 5. Of Orcs and Men. Everything's clear. Had easier jobs, but what the hell. Of Orcs and Men is an RPG, which came out in 2012. This game was actually developed by two different studios, Cyanide Studios and Spiders. I was always curious about this game because I heard some nice things about it. After playing it for the purposes of this video, I can see why people wanted me to cover it. There's something seriously wrong with this guy. This is probably the most unique game from Spider Studios because of the way it plays. It's labeled as an action RPG, which is true to some extent, but not entirely. I would say it plays very similar to CRPGs with real-time pause, but from third-person perspective. And you only get to control two different characters throughout the entire game. But we'll get to the gameplay real soon. Of Orcs and Men follows the story of an orc named Arkai, who is an elite member of notorious Bloodjaw clan. They are known to be ferocious and bloodthirsty warriors, and even other orcs you meet in the game fear the Bloodjaw clan. Arkai and a couple of more members of the clan are on a mission to kill the human king, and this is essentially the whole point of the main quest in the game. At first, it seems like an impossible mission, or mission impossible. Bloodjaw clan has some powerful allies who will help you with this mission and shortly after you begin the game you get to meet one of them. No, I'm not like them. I'm a survivor. Styx is a second playable character and he teams up with Arkai. Styx is a goblin and he's unusually intelligent. Goblins are very low intelligent creatures in this game, so Styx is an exception. This guy's talking bullshit. In some cases, you will get a different outcome and maybe trigger an extra side quest or avoid the combat with dialogue and that's pretty much it. But still, it's nice to have these extra options even though they seem like an illusion of choice most of the time. It feels like a linear story in general. The story itself is not all that interesting and it lacks memorable characters outside of Arca and Styx. Arca and Styx are definitely the most memorable and interesting characters in the whole game and they have a nice chemistry together. The Inquisition tramples our beliefs and denies our existence. They want to wipe my people off the face of the world. Ah, play me another sad song and I'll cry on your shoulder. Arka is a bit generic though. He's a strong orc with a sense of pride, while Styx is everything opposite of that. Styx's personality is very likable and his dialogue is almost always entertaining. He's also the narrator of the game, so you'll hear him a lot in different cutscenes. Speaking of which, there are a bunch of different in-game cutscenes. Come to think of it, it's a very story-based RPG, although the story itself is not the biggest strength of the game, if you ask me. However, the dialogue can be very fun. Not amazing or anything, but I thought it was interesting throughout the whole game. Arca and Styx will get into various situations together, and it's up to you how you're going to approach them in dialogue. Like I said, it doesn't feel like the game is giving you some very meaningful choices, but they can make you laugh, especially Styx's reactions. This guy's talking bullshit. Although the swearing can feel really forced. Don't get me wrong, I prefer when characters swear in games because it's more realistic. But when it's overdone and out of place, it can be exactly the opposite, it feels unrealistic. Putting that aside, I enjoy the dialogue between Styx and Arkai quite a bit. The story itself is not all that interesting, but it was okay for what it is. There are some plot twists, but it's nothing crazy. Your main mission remains the same for pretty much the entire game. So what about the gameplay? It's a weird mix of third-person real-time action, which has a pause button on top of that. 
you get to issue different commands in the pause menu for both characters and there is a light RPG progression system. When I first got to try out the combat in this game, I thought I'm not going to like it that much. But it kinda grew on me the more I played, especially because it works pretty well. I started the game on hard, but I quickly changed it to normal and played it like that throughout the entire game. The game can be pretty challenging even on normal, especially if you don't pay attention to what you're doing. However, once you learn how everything works, you can pretty much approach all combat situations in the same manner. Both characters have a couple of different fighting styles and more than enough different skills to use. Sticks can take the advantage of becoming invisible, which can help you in some regular fights. The stealth gameplay plays out like a little puzzle, because the game will usually allow you to kill a certain number of enemies before getting exposed. Some NPCs are placed conveniently in certain positions for stealth kills and this works fine. However, there are a bunch of fights where we won't be able to use the stealth because of the cutscene. I played Arka as a melee tank, while I tried to move sticks for ranged attacks and this works pretty well. Although Arkai has a very annoying mechanic that you won't be able to avoid, which is the Berserk mode. He becomes a lot stronger and faster, but you won't be able to control him and he can even attack sticks, so that's why it's always smart to move sticks in the range position. It's a cool mechanic on paper, but after a while it becomes very annoying. To make things even more confusing, I'm not even sure how it triggers. I thought it only triggers when Arka is low on health, but no, it's pretty random actually. So most of the time it feels like you're only controlling sticks in combat while Arka is doing his own thing. And the recovery time from Berserk mode is way too long, assuming that Arkai survives the fight. I really wish this mechanic wasn't in the game because it actively makes the combat worse. The game also lacks meaningful boss fights and I kinda see why. While the combat system is fine when you're fighting multiple regular NPCs, it doesn't work all that great versus one stronger enemy. In fact, you won't even know you're fighting some stronger NPCs, it feels exactly the same like regular fights. It might be the normal difficulty, but I'm not talking about the time it takes to kill the enemy. The game just lacks unique spells and mechanics for enemies. That makes the main antagonist of the game totally forgettable and almost pointless. Like I said, the combat works fine and the challenge is there, so I think this was fixable, in a way. But that would require the game to have more than two playable characters and some well-designed boss fights with actual unique mechanics. It is what it is though, and I don't hate it. What I'm not a huge fan of is the level design in this game. The visual variety of these levels is decent, but gameplay-wise it's extremely linear and simplistic. You can easily tell by just taking a look at all of these maps, they are pretty much all like this. Sometimes the game will try to put a slightly interesting twist on the level design. Sticks will have some optional paths to take, which leads him into the position of using his stealth abilities easier. It doesn't happen that often, and even when it does, it's not a huge deal. The exploration is almost non-existing in this game. This is one of the widespread problems with Spider's RPGs in general. You will have some loot here and there, and you can also buy things from some NPCs. When you gain enough experience, Arka and Sticks will level up together. You can increase their stats, get new skills or improve the ones you already have. The progression system is very simple and straightforward. Yeah, what he said. Of Orcs and Men is a story based RPG and I guess we should judge it by those standards. I don't think it's a great storytelling RPG but the fun factor can be high if you enjoy this kind of humor. Styx was interesting enough to make an entire new game about him by the way. And we'll soon get to that part as well, trust me. Overall, Of Orcs and Men is a mixed bag, but the game feels unique, or unconventional, would be a better term to describe it. What the fuck are you talking about? How is that even possible? Number 4. Our Clash Legacy. Our Clash Legacy is a tactical role-playing game released in 2013. Now, if you didn't notice already, there is a very short gap between release dates of these Cyanide games. They have more than 100 employees, so I guess they can afford to make multiple teams that work on different projects. And so far, only one of these games we talked about has been developed with the help of another studio, which would be of Fox and Men. Whatever the case might be, they were developing these games like crazy back in the day. Anyway, Arkush Legacy was Cyanide's second attempt at making a tactical RPG. But this time around, they did a substantially better job. The reception for this game was pretty damn solid in general, although it only sits on mostly positive on Steam. 
To put it simply, Arklash Legacy is everything that Confrontation should have been, and it's quite possibly the most underrated game on this list. What have you done with my sister? Nothing. And if she has a face like yours, that's probably the best she can hope for. I honestly didn't expect to have so much fun while playing this game, but I did, and I'm going to try and explain why. The majority of problems I had with Confrontation have been addressed, starting with the control scheme. Controlling your party now feels very responsive. The characters react instantly to your commands, which is actually really important in this game. That's because the gameplay constantly requires you to pay attention to your positioning, and pausing the game to issue different commands is pretty much necessary. However, if you don't like to pause the game that much, you might find this gameplay a bit tedious, but if that's the case, you probably don't like tactical gameplay in general. The game doesn't require you to constantly micromanage each and every move of your characters. You usually have to reposition some of your characters to get away from the danger or align them for a healing spell. Speaking of characters, they are much more interesting and unique compared to those from Confrontation. There are a lot of cutscenes and party banter and some light relationship between them. All dialogue lines are voice acted and the story itself is not that bad either. Your party can have 4 characters at once, but as you progress through the game, you'll meet more playable characters. Then you'll get the option to mix and match those new characters however you please. What I didn't like that much is when the game forces you to use certain characters on specific levels because of the story reasons, I guess. As soon as I got used to my party of 4 and their abilities, the game tried to flip the script with new characters and I really didn't like those segments. That's because you have very little time to get used to those new characters and their abilities and get in some gear pieces if possible. I mean, I'm not complaining because you get more characters, I just hate when the game forces you to play with them. The enemies don't play around in this game, even on normal difficulty. I started the game on hard, but I quickly changed my mind because that difficulty doesn't give you much room for mistakes. I really enjoyed the challenge on the normal difficulty because you have to take the advantage of each and every character and it's very important how you utilize the spells. This game has a holy trinity gameplay style of combat, you have a tank, DPS and support characters. You don't have to follow this philosophy and the game tries to encourage you to experiment. But I would only recommend doing that later in the game or maybe even on your second playthrough. It's not that easy, that's what I'm trying to say. I died a bunch of times in various fights, but it always felt like it was completely my fault. Except in some rare occasions where spells are not exactly well telegraphed, like in this situation. Other than that, you can always learn what to do in your second attempt if you fall in combat. The game is very linear, you just go from one map to another and there are some optional areas where you can get some extra loot, but that's pretty much it. The linear nature of this game didn't bother me that much because the gameplay felt pretty damn good in general and it was very addictive. Once you started playing, it was very hard to stop, which can tell you a lot about the game. Then again, don't expect some great depth from this game. This is still a very simple and linear strategy RPG. I wouldn't necessarily call this game a strategy RPG, like it's advertised on Steam. It's more of a strategy action adventure with some very light RPG elements. You have skill trees, leveling up and some very light itemization. All characters will automatically get new spells upon leveling up, but you get to choose how you invest your points into skill trees. You can either alter the existing spells they have or just increase their effectiveness. I think they did a great job with the spells and the skill trees. Changing the effect of the spell can drastically affect your gameplay. For example, the tank character has Taunt, which is like a ranged spell that you can use on all enemies. But once you reach a certain point in the skill tree, you can choose to add more effects on the spell or completely change how it works. By doing so, you can root yourself in place and all enemies in vicinity will automatically be taunted, but you will lose the ability to use Taunt as a ranged spell. What I like about these decisions, it truly feels like they all matter because they instantly affect your gameplay and how you approach it. When it comes to itemization, there are only a couple of miscellaneous item types that you can loot, but they can noticeably improve your stats. All characters have a bunch of different stats and they are pretty important, especially on hard difficulties. Items have different quality levels and you also have a nice little mechanic to scrap the items you don't need. And once you scrapped enough items, you get an epic quality item, which is pretty cool. 
the main gist of the story is that your party is being haunted for the crimes they didn't commit. For the most part, it's a generic story of war between forces of light and darkness, but it's not that bad. Like I said, all characters are voice acted, with varying degrees of quality, but there is a certain charm to it. Huh. Who's the dwarf? He's a brother and a friend. His name is Friends. We spent three years in the same corps together, with Denzel and Tineman. Welcome, Friends. I mourn for your loss. The characters are kinda memorable, but don't expect an amazing story from this game, even though it's a huge improvement from Confrontation. Overall, I would definitely recommend playing this game if you like tactical gameplay and if you don't mind the linear nature of it. I feel to Earth's power. I live. Ha! Number three, Sticks, Master of Shadow. Styx Master of Shadow is a stealth action adventure released in 2014. Yeah, that sticks. This guy's talking bullshit. When we covered the Forks and Men, I mentioned that Styx has its own game. This is actually a prequel to A Forks and Men, and it's one of the best games from Cyanide Studios. It has very positive reviews on Steam, 71 meta score, and 7.2 user score. Cyanide Studio took a really likable character from one of their games, and they made a great stealth action adventure. I'm not so crazy about stealth games in general, but I couldn't put this game down once I started playing it. First of all, I love how they cared enough to hire the same guy who voiced Styx before. But this time around, the story and the dialogue are much improved compared to a Fox and Men. All of the problems I had with the story and dialogue in that game are pretty much gone. The story is more straightforward and it's a lot more interesting in general. At the end of it, you will learn how the goblins were created and why Styx is different from other goblins, but let's not try to spoil anything. Excuse me, but uh, what are you? Well, I mean, uh, I never had dealings with something, with someone who looks like you. Well, there ain't anyone who looks like me. That's why your mother liked me so much. Now fuck off, I got work to do. Some parts of this story will be familiar to you if you played of Orcs and Men, but there isn't a huge connection. Anyway, the game begins with a cutscene where Styx is talking about the world tree and this mysterious substance called Amber. He's having a lot of headaches and he also hears voices, which later turns out to be the main plot twist of the game. It was very unpredictable actually, and I was pleasantly surprised with the quality of writing and storytelling in general. I mean, sure, it's hyper-focused on one character, which will be Styx, of course, but I think that's the main strength of the story. Some people and elves are also included, although they play a minor role in the story. Styx is heavily connected to Amber, and this is also an important gameplay mechanic. I think the story is much more satisfying if you play the Forks and Men first, because you know there is a bigger universe out there that's not just revolved around this one character. This guy's talking bullshit. Styx has the same charm from the previous game, which means that he's still swearing a lot. But this time around I think he's done way better, and it feels more natural because the quality of the writing has gone up. Damn. Querberus really went all out. Kind of a bitch to get him out of here though. Then again, that never stopped me before. So what about the gameplay? Well, I'm glad you asked. The short version is, it's pretty damn good. This is hands down the most polished game from Sina Studio and it feels like it had enough development time. I had zero bugs or crashes and the game works great on high settings in 4K. The game is called Master of Shadow for a reason. Styx is well equipped with various tools for sneaking around and killing unaware enemies. The level design is very good for the most part, although there are some frustrating parts but they are few and far between. Moving sticks around the map is pretty seamless because of the good controls. The jump can feel a bit floaty sometimes, but it's not that bad really, and I almost never fail to make a precise jump. The game is all about being silent because if you make noise, the guards will start looking for you. Once you're caught, your only option is to run away or to try and fight, which is not really recommended. You see, Sticks doesn't really have a proper combat system, you can only try to parry or use the dodge roll button. Parry works great when you're fighting one or two enemies, and you can improve it a bit with learning some skills. But for the most part, you will want to avoid the combat unless your back is against the wall. 
In fact, the sequel to this game has the option to completely turn off the combats by selecting a higher difficulty, which just goes to show you how the combat is not a huge factor by any means. Styx has an amber tattoo that lights up when enemies are close, which is a subtle and useful mechanic. It helps you a lot with the map awareness, without making the gameplay too cheesy or frustrating. I also like how it's not just a gameplay gimmick, it's actually related to the story of the game. I played the game on hard, although the difficulty doesn't seem like a huge factor in the game. It's mostly related to how fast the enemies can detect you, but that also depends on the AI, so it's a bit redundant. Speaking about AI, I would say it's decent when you're in stealth, and pretty damn stupid when they detect you. It's on Skyrim's level of must be the wind, and it's very easy to outmaneuver the NPCs in order to regain stealth. You can usually just jump above or below them and hide behind the nearest object or one of the many strategic places on the map. The level design offers you a lot of places where you can hide, but it also has a lot of things that you can stumble upon which can make noise. NPCs have very simple walking patterns which are easy to memorize after just one glance. But you still have to be careful with your movement and how you kill NPCs. Not extremely careful or precise, I never felt like the gameplay was tedious. Although I'm guessing that hardcore stealth gamers will find this game a bit underwhelming and less punishing than some harder stealth games. Like I said before, Styx uses Amber as the main resource. You can use it to highlight interactable objects and NPCs, create a clone of yourself or go invisible for a couple of seconds. I think the invisibility was the most useful ability because it can help you a lot, especially in some very sweaty situations. The game kinda tries to put a bigger emphasis on the cloning ability, but I didn't use it that much unless it was necessary. You have a couple of different categories of skills that you can learn by spending learning points you get from completing a mission. You gain certain amount of points depending on how well you completed the mission, I think. It's an ok progression system and I mostly focused on killing enemies from stealth. Some of the clone abilities sound cool, but I just didn't bother with them because maybe that's just not my playstyle. You also get some useful gadgets like throwing knives which can instantly kill NPCs or throwing sand that can extinguish a light source. I also like how the game puts you in the first person perspective when you crawl under certain objects on the map. Not only that, but the levels have a lot of tiny tunnels which are very useful. The game always shows you exactly where you need to go, but it also gives you a couple of ways to get there for the most part. It's a very vertical level design and again, it's done really well. To sum it up, I really love this game and I would definitely recommend trying it out. This guy's talking bullshit. Number 2. Sticks, Shards of Darkness. Gone, beat it, Rakash. Can't stand staring your stupid face any longer. This is obviously a sequel to Master of Shadows. Shards of Darkness came out in 2017 and it was received identically to the first game. The game currently sits on very positive on Steam and it has 72 meta score and 77 user score. That will make it the best rated cyanide game, at least from this list. To put it simply, if you like the first game, you're going to like this one as well. It made some notable improvements and it added more content basically. I'm going to focus on those improvements, but let's first talk about the technical state of the game. Right from the start, I had some sound issues. The sound would randomly completely cut out for a couple of seconds and this happens throughout the whole game. But there is a simple fix for it that I found on Steam forums. Besides the sound issues, the NPCs have some visual glitches and their AI is arguably even worse in this game. Don't get me wrong, it's still functional and it gets the job done, but you will have a bunch of hilarious moments. It was a bit disappointing that this game didn't feel polished as Master of Shadows, but I still managed to run it fine on 4K with somewhat stable frame rates. Controlling sticks in this game feels pretty much the same, if not a little bit improved. In Master of Shadow, I died just a couple of times while jumping around, but in this game, that number went way up. That's probably because of the level design. It's a lot more open in this game, but it's pretty damn good. Shards of Darkness kept the same philosophy for the level design. You have a couple of different ways to reach your objective and even more areas where you can hide. Closed areas always have different paths to take and sometimes you don't even notice this unless you die and repeat the segments. Then we have the skill trees which are bigger but not drastically bigger. It's the same idea for abilities like in the first game with some changes and new gadgets. I like how they included some of the skills from the first game right from the start. 
For example, you had to spend points to learn how to kill enemies from the cover, but now it's unlocked by default. As well as some other abilities, like being able to see the vision of NPCs. You can change your dagger and outfit, which comes with a couple of different benefits and penalties. And there are a lot more stuff to loot in this game in general. They also included a couple of more ways to kill your enemies by interacting with objects on the map, such as chandeliers or poisonous barrels. Back then, a lot of games started using weapon wheels or utility wheels in this particular case. It definitely makes it a bit easier to use your items. I noticed that NPCs will try to light the torch when you put it out, which is kinda cool, but not so important. I wish they focused more improving the NPCs in general, instead of adding this feature. I played the game on the second difficulty, which would be normal I guess. Everything above that difficulty turns off the combat completely, and I didn't want to do that. That's because I can usually handle a couple of NPCs if I'm detected, so I still think the combat is useful in those situations. Although there is a very high chance that you get yourself killed when detected because there are far more NPCs in this game. The story in this game was not very good in my opinion. It's still a very simple story with just a couple of characters, but I think it was a bit random and boring. Styx is hired by a goblin hunter named Heladrin to steal a magical scepter. She wants the scepter so that she can get an entry into the Dark Elf Mountain Fortress. To spy the elves or something, I don't know. The story introduces some semi-interesting characters later on, but I really didn't care that much. On the bright side, the game has a much better presentation and it feels like they had a bigger budget, which would be logical. There are a bunch of cutscenes and this time around they're in engine. I actually like how the cutscenes are done, even though the story is not very good. Besides the cutscenes, the game looks way better and there are some very impressive moments. Styx is way chattier in this game as well and I think they tried a little bit too hard to make him interesting. It's a bit forced, but if you like this character, you're probably not going to mind. Well, this is where the shitstorm begins. Overall, I would recommend playing this game if you like the first one. Oh, and by the way, Styx will roast you when you die, and he likes to break the fourth wall quite a bit in these segments. Ah! You are dead. No, I'm dead. You'll be out getting laid soon. Wait, lean in closer to the screen. Hmm, maybe not. Number 1. Werewolf the Apocalypse, Earthblood. Werewolf the Apocalypse is the latest action adventure from Sine Studio. This game released in 2021 and it got some pretty bad reviews. It sits on mostly positive reviews on Steam though, and very positive recent reviews, but that's just a handful of people. My initial impressions were not that great, especially because of the extremely generic Unreal Engine 4 art style. The low visual fidelity is not exactly my problem with this, even though the game can be very ugly sometimes with mushy, low resolution textures, which is especially noticeable in cutscenes. I have a bigger problem with the very generic look for the characters and the environments. Unreal Engine can produce some of the best looking games out there. But on the other side, a lot of lower budget and indie games can look something like this, and I played a bunch of similar looking games. I don't know what looks more uninspiring, exteriors or interiors. The character models are hideous, even for 2009, yet alone the current year. That would be completely fine with me if the game didn't focus that much on the storytelling, which it does. I think the story is pretty bad, there is no point to talk around this. The game puts you in the shoes of the werewolf called Cahill. You work for a group that fights against a large corporate organization, which apparently hates werewolves or something. And they also do various experiments with a mysterious substance. Cahill has a wife that dies in first 5 minutes, and the game expects you to care about this. In his blind rage, Cahill accidentally kills another friendly member of the group, and he decides to leave them for 5 years. Oh yeah, he also has a daughter that he left with the group. For 5 years. Don't worry, our work here is nearly finished. So let me get this straight, her mom dies and her father, who is a werewolf by the way, lives for 5 years. <laughs> like damn. I at least hope she has a long and happy life. As soon as Kehli returns to the group, his daughter goes on a dangerous mission and of course she gets captured. <laughs> Look, I'm going to stop right here because it only gets dumber. The dialogue is okay-ish, but there is too much of it sometimes. Maybe that's just because I found the story boring, I don't know. To be honest, I think that even Confrontation had a more interesting story than this. 
I would rather be confused by that game than be extremely bored by Cahill's lack of parenting skills and his rage problems. <laughs> well, fuck you two. Which brings us to the gameplay. Now, of course, the main gist of the gameplay is being able to transform into a werewolf. And this is where the game is at its best, because it's pretty fun to tear enemies apart in this form. Not literally, because the game doesn't have a mutilation system, which is a bit disappointing. But even so, fighting enemies in this form is pretty fun for a while. The animations are decent, some abilities are pretty cool, and the action is fast, but it still manages to feel impactful. The progression system feels tacked on, like in many other Cyanide games. You feel very strong from the very beginning, but that doesn't mean the game is not challenging enough, you will have to dodge a lot of attacks. Regular enemies can be killed with one or two hits, while some NPCs require you to change your stance. The heavy stance makes you a lot slower, but it deals way more damage to stronger enemies and you get different abilities as well. The heavy stance makes the action a bit worse because of how slow you move, but it's not that bad. The game just failed to introduce some interesting enemies as you progress, which will make you fight a bit differently. It feels like all you're doing throughout the whole game is dodging shit on the floor. I mean, sure, some games can make that interesting, but Werewolf the Apocalypse is not one of those games. Every single fight in the game feels the same to me, whether that's regular NPCs, elite NPCs or bosses. However, I think the biggest problem with the combat is the repetitive nature of it. I got bored after a couple of hours, but that's not only because of the combat. Come to think of it, the combat would be just fine if other features of the game were a bit better, which would make the whole experience more interesting, if that makes sense. The game tries to break the monotony with stealth segments, which don't fit that well if you ask me. I mean, why would you bother with sneaking around and slowly killing enemies when you could just one-shot them as a werewolf? But the game usually gives you the option to completely disregard the stealth and go berserk, which can create some very amusing moments, I ain't gonna lie. I'm here to be recruited. You? <laughs> How'd you make it through the physical without breaking a hip? However, the stealth itself is very basic but functional, I guess. I know I've been saying that a lot for certain segments of these games, but they all kind of feel the same, in a way. Which is not too surprising, I guess, since they're all developed by the same team. You can see some similarities with sticks when it comes to level design. But this game is far worse in general, especially when it comes to stealth and level design. At its best, this game can feel like a blast from the past. Whether that's good or bad, it will depend on your personal preferences. I would only recommend playing this if you're super into hack and slash games and if you want something that feels like it came out on PlayStation 3 or Xbox 360. The game is just not for me and I quickly got bored for all the reasons I mentioned. When you think about it, we really need studios like Cyanide. This guy's talking bullshit. Even though some of these games are objectively pretty bad, that never stopped them from experimenting with different genres and trying something new. They are not afraid to take risks and I can definitely respect that. Although it does seem like they spread themselves too thin sometimes when it comes to some of these games. I think Styx Master of Shadows was their peak, but I also think they could do a lot better. If they can afford to put all of their resources into one bigger game. That's easier said than done of course, but I think this studio is talented enough to make great games. Wait a moment, didn't Cyanide released Bloodborne 3 recently and it got plagued with microtransactions? Exclusive cheerleader. Exclusive cheerleader. Singular. I can buy a cheaper dice! I, physical dice aren't even three dollars! You're gonna charge me digital, digital dice for three dollars! Are you fucking out of your mind? These dice won't improve your luck, but they might impress your opponent. This pack includes three exclusive logos for customizing your dice! <laughs> Although I'm willing to bet that the publisher Nakon had a lot of things to say about this, so I won't necessarily blame Cyanide only. Anyway, tell me what you think about this studio and their games. Did you play some of them and which one did you like or hate the most? Leave a comment down below. I'll also have GOG links for some of these games in the description, so if you want to support the channel, you can buy them through those links. Speaking of supporting the channel, I just launched my personal store where you can buy some interesting t-shirts and hoodies. Check out some cool designs in the theme of the channel, like this RPG Zone hoodie or Nameless Hero t-shirt. But you'll find a lot more if you follow the link in the description. I think that's a great way to get something back for supporting the channel. And of course, you can always become a Patreon or a YouTube member and get your name on the end credits of my videos. 
many thanks to all of my current supporters and I'll see you in the next one.